Good evening to all of you here at the Granville Island stage and to everyone who is joining us through live stream. We're really pleased that you're here to join us for this fourth um, in the Inspire Jericho Talk series. My name is Elisa Campbell. I'm with the Canada Lands Company and I'm gonna be moderating tonight's session. We're gathering in the unceded traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil And I'd like to invite Elder Sequalia from the Squamish Nation to say our welcoming words. Oh yeah, I don't have to walk over there. I have a mic on. I don't usually use the mic because I have a loud voice, but they asked me to use a mic tonight. So I'm attempting to not speak too loud. On hoth and squalwin, quis clake a quichnomi, tenoyopin, and sequedo, and siayite, to squiles, to seats. I'm really glad to, that you all came here tonight, all of you, my family, and my friends. Kayochtin, Kayochtin. I welcome you to our ancestral, unceded Coast Salish territories of the Skahomish Okamayok, Squamish Nation, Tsleil-Waututh, and Musqueam. Sequalia Kwashaman Sna. Sequalia is my ancestral name, aka Ann Wanik is what's on my status card and my BCID. And um, Wanik is actually a traditional name from up Alert Bay, my late husband. I have my um, daughter and niece here tonight, Skalau Tanat. And um, we're descendant from Shinaltzit Sequalton, and he had a son named Shinaltzit. The priest named him Jericho Charlie. And he had a longhouse at Iamo, and his brother-in-law had a house there, longhouse there, Tohohwamken and Iamshalot, Shinaltzit's sister. When they created reserves, they moved them on to Sinalk. And then in later days, they named the um, area Iamo after our, my great-grandfather, her great-great-grandfather and called it Jericho Beach. And that's where our family lived from time immemorial. It was our Skahot Meshok village where Shinaltzit lived. Sinalk is where the Hatsalano family lived in Sitako family. And then our family is related and was living there. Our, my great-grandmother married to Shinaltzit Kwewat, Sally, they were buried right where the footings for um, the Burrard Street Bridge was our cemetery. And my grandfather and Uncle August had to move them up to Squamish. So just to give you some idea, and Hatsalano and all our families met Captain Vancouver and Fraser and the Spanish when they came in. And when they created the reserve, IR number six, it was felt to be an eyesore to have an Indian reserve, just like Yamok was a bit of an eyesore. And that's what we're here talking about, Jericho. So the, a shady land deal was done with the Indian agent in the city, and they bought our Indian reserve, loaded us on barges, cut the lines, and set the family floating in the inlet. Lucky Kate's tugs saw them and some men in canoes and brought them to the North Shore. Then they thought, oh, we should honor the man who met Captain Vancouver and his descendants, and they couldn't say Hatsalano. Imagine if you had to say you're going to Hatsalano. So they anglicized it, and it's known as Kitsalano. That's where the name comes from. And we have um, Hatsalano Siam, my young grandnephew. 
still carries that name. My brother and grandson carry Chenault. So just some history to show you why we say unceded territories. We were removed not because we want it to be. And for us, and with our Tsleil-Waututh and Musqueam families, being able to do this um, partnership with Canada lands and develop Jericho lands is really meaningful because it will provide you, you know, provide for my great-grandchildren that aren't born. It's something that has come back to us after how we were treated in the past. So this is how you talk about reconciliation and being able to move forward in a good way. So I'm always glad to be able to be here with all of you. I'm going to sing Sequalia's song, Sequalia Slolem Ha Squile, greeting of the day, then say a prayer and turn it over. And I also, you know, I'm grateful you're all here and you're all willing to listen and share and understand the history because that's what we need to do is be able to look at where we come from and who we are. And that's what you all have to do when you think about your ancestors and where they came from. And why did you, they leave so that you ended up here? When I do the prayer, our ancestors believe that Kakakhanik, the creator, sends energy through the top of the head, down through the body. So I'm going to ask you to rise now. And we want the positive energy that I heard all the talking in the room. So now, are you ready to do some yoga and Tai Chi breathing? <laughs> and I say that because when I said the energy comes down through the top and Grandpa said we all have energy and we can heal ourselves. Every living person has it, but you have to keep your hands at your side. So I found that it's good to do like Tai Chi or yoga breathing, and lots of you probably do yoga. And just go. <sighs> Breathe. <sighs> then you'll leave your hands at your side. And if while I'm singing, I see you put your hands like this, I'm going to come use you for my drum. <laughs> and I've never had to before, so... And I like to have you all praying for your families, from the unborn to the oldest in all your families, especially those with serious illnesses and addictions. Pray for them and each other. Because the old people say, you don't pray for yourself because everyone else is praying for you. And we all believe in a higher power known by different names. We say Kakahanek. Oh, oh, oh.
है आ है Keep your hands open and pray. Yons yon so to no yop and man man, disquiles the seeds, yons yo man man squalowin, snaichum, tsetsop, sequadal chet. I'm asking that the Creator help each and every one of you with your squalowin, your mental, emotional, physical, spiritual well being. And for all of your families, your sequadal chet, from the unborn skako, unborn babies, man man children, parents, grandparents, and great grandparents. And to asking Creator to help each and every one of you with the words that you're going to hear tonight, to take them in, and what's meant for you will go into your hearts and minds, and what you don't need set aside till when you do need it and be able to speak the words about tonight and use them for the work that's going to go forward in the present and future. Asking prayers for all of our family and friends who have serious illnesses, the many cancers and getting treatment from them, from the littlest children to the oldest all of those with heart problems, the many different forms of heart problems, all the different arthritis that affects people and has them, some of them, not able to even leave home. Prayers for all of those who have different illnesses like the TB, HIV, AIDS, diabetes, meningitis, and many other illnesses I can't even name. And all of those who have serious injuries that are waiting for surgery or had surgery, all of our prayers hear us, Creator, for their healing, health, and recovery. Asking you, Creator, to hear everyone's prayers for their family and friends who may be battling drugs and alcohol especially with the opioid crisis that's taking people of all colors and ages and those incarcerated because of their addictions and though their families who love them and don't want to lose them. We pray for them to find that healing path to recovery and survive. And maybe one day they'll be sharing their story to help someone not go down that dark path asking prayers for all of our family who have lost loved ones, family and friends who have lost loved ones and have am squalowing, really strong feelings in their heart of sorrow, that the sorrows lift it to know that your loved ones worry about us here on earth who still have to walk this life, that they worry about us and send us signs. Sometimes the it will be a dragonfly, I read. They have two sets of wings because they carry angels on their backs. Or a hummingbird, or an eagle, raven, seal. Something that you don't you normally see and you're walking along and then all of a sudden there it is. 
It's probably one of your family coming to lift you up because then you change your mind and get all happy. So they help us. Remember that. Because one day you have this sorrow, you'll remember, you have, one day you'll remember them without grief and sorrow, but with laughter, smiles of the memories in your hearts and minds. And you'll be able to laugh and remember them and know they're with you. Asking prayers, Creator, for tonight's work, for our speakers who are going to share with us the good words, Yudwan Haltzaitzab, the excellent work we're going to do tonight, and share to be in Choma and Shkwalwan. One heart and one mind tonight, sharing different views, because it's all the different views that create the solutions to Chen Chen Stwight, stand and work together to hold each other up for the present and future generations. Tama Quitsi Snechim, Hoi Chaka. Was that all right? Thank you, Sequalia, for your words. You're welcome and your wisdom. They resonate and they guide us forward as we shape a great uh, neighborhood in the future. A few administrative details before moving forward. Uh, we are live streaming tonight's event, and again, welcome to those who are uh, joining us from elsewhere. Uh, during the question and answer session that will follow the uh, keynote speaker, Magnus's talk, we're going to ask for questions to be handed to us on one of these little white cards that you were given when you arrived. If you didn't get one, don't worry. There will be more handed around during the question and answer session and we will ask you to write your questions down and they'll be handed up and uh, conveyed to, to Magnus. Um, if you're participating in tonight's talk through live stream and you have questions, please feel free to submit them through comments on the Facebook connection and they'll be collected at our, uh, by our team here as well. Uh, City of Vancouver, and, and this will be covered um, by Neil Bershoi at the end of the presentation, but uh, the city would like your input. Um, and so you've hopefully gotten one of these red cards. Again, if you haven't got one yet, there's more out in the corridor. Um, and we'd really like to hear your thoughts on what inspires you through tonight's talk, and we invite you to drop those in the box on your way out. Finally, this session has been captured by video, and so it can be accessed uh, from your computer or television at a later date um, and, uh, and uh, shared with others who couldn't be here tonight. So I'd like now to introduce Dina Grinnell, the Vice President of Real Estate at Canada Lands Company, to introduce our other guests and move us forward. Good evening, my name is Dina Grinnell with Canada Lands and I'm here just to tell you a little bit about ourselves, uh, about our partnership with the Musqueam, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh Nations and, uh, and the work we're going to uh, do tonight. I just wanted to ask uh, how many of folks in the audience have been to one of our previous Inspire Jericho talks? Oh, quite a few. Okay, great. And quite a few newcomers. Uh, that's terrific. We've hosted four Inspired Jericho talks on themes that relate to the, the kind of work that we want to do together as when we launch the community planning process uh, in 2020. Uh, tonight's theme, Urban Resilience, an important one. Uh, I'm here tonight. I uh, just want to acknowledge a few people with Brennan Cook of Musqueam Squamish Slewa Tooth Development Corp, or MST Development Corp. Brendan and I guide uh, the day-to-day -day work of our joint venture uh, between Canada Lands and the Three Nations. We entered into a joint venture partnership in 2014 in order to oversee the planning and redevelopment of uh, three sites in Vancouver, uh, and the Heather Street lands and the Jericho lands are two very significant ones. I'd also like to point out a couple of other folks who are here tonight who are supporting our project work. Uh, Adrian Charlie is here with the Squamish Nation. Dennis Thomas is here with Slewa Tooth Nation. Uh, Dennis and Adrian are cultural liaisons that support us in bringing the culture and traditions uh, to the projects and liaising more uh, completely with the communities. Charlene Grant is also working with us as a cultural liaison. She's with Musqueam and wasn't able to join us. I'd also like to uh, or acknowledge that uh, we have a elected official here tonight. It's wonderful to see MP Joyce Murray joining us. Welcome. 
Uh, our work together in bringing forward the plans for these lands initiated uh, in 2014, as mentioned, we'd been focused for a couple of years on bringing forward a policy statement for the Heather Street lands. We asked the City of Vancouver to support us in the preparation of a, Heather, or of a policy statement that is uh, a neighborhood level plan and that was successfully ad adopted in 2018. We're now moving forward with the technical planning work to, towards rezoning on the Heather Street lands. And with that uh, success under our belt, which was a great process, we're looking forward to working with the city again uh, in order to collaborate on the preparation of a policy statement plan for Jericho. The Jericho lands, as mentioned, is a very unique property in that it's not only stunningly beautiful and significantly large, but it's home to the village of Yalmuk, and a lot of our nation's partners have ties, very close family ties to the land. So we'll be working very closely with our nation's partners in order to explore what a future redevelopment looks like that also engages the, the knowledge and traditions and practices of our nation's partners. Our collective goal is to transform these lands over the course of the next several years. This will be decades long this work uh, into a prosperous new community that's a benefit to the community, uh, to the city of Vancouver, to all Canadians, and of course brings prosperity to the three nations over generations. Our Inspire Jericho Talk series uh, have uh, embarked this year and we've talked about themes such as social wellness, respect the land, bringing walkable communities and now tonight urban resilience. And we'll look forward to bringing a theme on indigenous inspiration as well. Uh, so we look forward to uh, the talk. We look forward to hearing from you in the question and answer period and for you to share your comments with us and, of course, to remain involved in the Jericho planning process. Thanks. Thank you, Dina. And um, maybe, except for Magnus, if uh, I can invite you to be seated, we're going to be moving into our keynote talk. Um, we are really delighted tonight to have the opportunity to be inspired by our keynote speaker, Magnus Schoen, uh, and to tap into ideas and creativity from our northern friends and colleagues in Scandinavia, in Sweden, who are known to be leaders in addressing some of our current and very real urban challenges, including climate change. Uh, Magnus has joined us from Stockholm, uh, where he works as an architect, landscape architect, and sustainability specialist at a firm called Code Architecture, and I'm looking forward to hearing Magna say that with the appropriate uh, Swedish accent rather than my, my Canadian accent. Um, and, uh, and it's been a delight to have Magnus come uh, because an important driving force for his work, and you will see this through his presentation, is to combine architecture and landscape architecture in a really synthetic way to find solutions to current urban challenges, such as climate adaptation, but in a way that really builds on the power of ecosystems to achieve the many solutions that, uh, that we are looking for. And that includes such things as creating vibrant spaces, affordable housing, and all of the things that we really like to bring into a great neighborhood. Uh, he does this through design and development projects uh, with Code Architecture, as well as through combining research with practice, and Magnus will share some of those ideas with us. As we prepared for this session, and, and in the time that Magnus has been here in uh, Vancouver over the past couple of days, he talked with me about how in Stockholm they view Vancouver as a leader in terms of sustainability and urban cities that are tackling some important and real challenges in, in a leadership way. And he queried um, and identified that it was kind of ironic that he was being invited here as, uh, as a leader in, 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 and a thought leader in this realm, when so much of that is seen to, to reside in Vancouver, and I would agree. I think best practices and examples of exciting approaches to these challenges can be found in both cities and in other cities around the world. And it's in through sharing these best practices and coming together and sharing creativity and inspiring ideas that maybe we continue, can continue to push the bar higher. Um, be it new innovative ideas or old ones that are still successful, reminding ourselves how to open up the box and invite as many creative ideas as possible so that we can achieve our project aspirations, in our case specifically for the redevelopment of the Jericho lands. So it's really exciting for myself and for all of our partners uh, to have Magnus here to spark some ideas and share some inspiration. 
As a reminder, we'll hold questions until the end of his presentation, and then we'll have an opportunity for a bit more of a conversation. So with no further ado, please uh, welcome Magna Schoen. Thank you, Elisa. I'm Magnus Schoen. Um, good evening. It's very exciting to be here. Thank you all for coming. Um, thank you, Elders Qualia, for the warm welcome. Um, this is um, the view from my kitchen window. And you see my part of Stockholm, um, not the typical postcard view. And my home is located on one of the islands that make up the central parts of the city. It's autumn. We have four seasons, just like you do here in, in Canada. Um, Stockholm is in Scandinavia, as most of you know, Northern Europe, and there are almost uh, two million people in the greater Stockholm region. Um, Stockholm is also a city that's considered to be quite green and sustainable. But of course, um, there are many challenges such as segregation and income inequalities and housing shortages. Stockholm is quite easy to live in, especially if you're a privileged white male like myself. But um, we live as if we had four planets of natural resources to use, and my lifestyle is causing way more than one ton of greenhouse gas emissions a year, which is where we need to be to meet the Paris Agreement. And that's why, in recent years, I've chosen to focus more on sustainability alongside my job as a landscape architect and architect, so that you know, we can try to stay within the planetary boundaries. Um, I'm also thinking about my children um, because the construction industry, which I'm part of, has so much negative impact in our world and I have at least some possibilities to change that. Then why wouldn't I if um, that could lead to a better future for my kids? And I'm also looking forward to what new kind of architecture and urbanism this new sustainability focus will lead to. Um, I didn't come here by sailing boat. Um, I'm not as cool as uh, the Swedish younger generation at all. So let's hope that those tons of carbon dioxide burned by the aircraft that I was in was worth coming here. And I hope that I can inspire to a more sustainable Jericho lands. So as Elisa said, I'm with Cord Architects. Um, we're a mid-sized architecture studio, about 25 people working there. And we're trying to have a holistic view um, which means that we're working with architecture, landscape architecture, urban planning, and we have a little branch called development and innovation. About 10% of our work goes into there, and we do a little bit of management as well. And our philosophy is human-centered, uh, site-specific, and we're also always trying to balance the needs of the client, the site, and the city. And uh, as I said, always trying to stay within the planetary boundaries. Okay, so here we go. Um, Swedish architects declare climate um, and biodiversity emergency. Uh, this is um, originally an initiative from the UK. I think you have one in Canada as well. Um, um, we're one of the founding signatories for the Swedish version, um, and about 270 offices in Sweden have signed so far. And this is what it says. The twin crisis of climate breakdown and biodiversity loss are the most serious issue of our time. Buildings and construction play a major part, accounting for nearly 40% of energy-related carbon dioxide emissions, whilst also having a significant impact on our natural habitats. For everyone working in the construction industry, meeting the needs of our society without breaching the Earth's ecological boundaries will demand a paradigm shift in our behavior. And together with our clients, we will need to commission and design buildings, cities, and infrastructures as indivisible components of a larger constantly regenerating and self-sustaining system. The research and technology exists for us to begin that transformation now, but what has been lacking is collective will. And recognizing this, we're committing to strengthen our working practices to create architecture and urbanism that has a more positive impact on the world around us. So we declare that and we commit to a creative solution. But I would also like the general public to read into this a little bit and understand what our aims are and aspirations are. So please Google Architects Declare and support this declaration. Um, so how did we end up in this crisis? So ever since the post-war period, there has been an exponential acceleration of most things you can imagine. 
The standard of living has gone up, at least in the industrial parts of the world. Consumption, energy consumption, greenhouse gas emissions, temperature increase, and extinction of species. And most of this can be attrib attributed to our extreme use of fossil fuel. And I thought that we should follow this timeline um, to um, see also how the environmental movement and sustainability issues has developed, and also link that to how we have planned our cities uh, and looking at Stockholm as an example. And then finally come to what we call resilient urbanism, talk a little bit about what that is. Um, so in Stockholm, at the beginning of this acceleration, the economy was very strong after the war. We were never at war. And large housing policy initiatives were made to remedy the poor housing conditions in the city at the time. And we developed new housing standards and a new planning ideology, which was called neighborhood units, that would be located along a new subway line. And the planning principle was called ABC Towns, where A stands for uh, work and B stands for housing and C stands for center, where people could live work and have access to shops, community service within short distances. And the buildings were situated in the landscape, taking advantage of the natural environment instead of altering it. And 1962 saw the birth of the global environmental movement as a response to the industrialization of the world. Rachel Carson shows in her book, Silent Spring, how chemical pesticides like DDT would disrupt and damage ecosystems and even threaten human life. And limits to growth shows through data simulations already in 1972 how the extreme extraction of natural resources would lead to catastrophic consequences. And 1972 was also the first time a human environment was on the global agenda, a starting point for a united approach to saving the environment. And so back in Stockholm, um, the Great Acceleration meant that more and more people were drawn to the cities in the early 60s for work and opportunities. And the housing shortage became more urgent. And the so-called Million Program was developed. Um, it was a governmentally funded program that would produce one million homes in 10 years, not only in Stockholm, but all over Sweden. New areas were developed with rational, the industrialized construction methods. Um, construction sites were arranged so that efficient assembly of prefabricated concrete elements were possible. And we also saw the rise of planning for private cars in our towns and cities. Now, instead of adapting the buildings to the site, the terrain had to be adapted to the buildings. And of course, globally, there were reactions to these trends of industrialization, like Jane Jacobs highlighted the devastating effects of motorways and cars in our cities. And um, Ian McCaug highlighted the importance of designing with nature instead of against. And Jan Giel stressed the importance of life between buildings, what makes people comfortable and willing to use public space. So in the 80s, in Skarpnäck, in southern Stockholm, we saw the return of the urban grid. And it was praised by Jan Giel for its human scale, walkable streets and green courtyards, and the cars they were in the periphery. It was still planned like the 50s suburbs as one node on the subway line. So we, it was a little bit disconnected to the rest of the city. The Brundtland Report in 87 was the first document to talk about sustainable development globally. It introduced the three dimensions of sustainability and the need to balance them for a sustainable future. They also define sustainable development as a development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And the next global step towards sustainable development was the 1992 Rio conference, also known as Earth Summit. An agenda for the 21st century was approved and several other documents like the Forest Principles, the Convention on Biological Diversity, and the Convention on Climate Change were produced. And I think um, the Agenda 21 must have had an effect on urban planning in Stockholm. I'm not sure exactly how, but in the 90s, 90s we saw two rather different approaches to environmentally friendly neighborhoods take form. One called Understenshöden, in the bottom there, and the other more famous one is called Hammarby Sjöstad. 
And uh, Understandshöjden was an initiative from local citizens with support from a developer. In the outskirts of the center, an urban eco-village was created. It was partly a self-build project with environmentally friendly building materials. And they have uh, local water cycles, local energy production from biofuels. And the whole site is governed by the local residents. And uh, in my opinion, it became a very, very beautiful environment. Low density, but still very, very livable. So um, Hammarby Sjöstad, on the other hand, was a major investment by the municipality. And it's built on um, old brownfields. It was more of an extension of the existing urban fabric and a new tramway line connected to the city. It consists of about 11,000 apartments and about 350,000 square meters of workspaces. And the environmental program for this area was very, very ambitious. It was supposed to spearhead ecological and environmentally friendly planning and building in Sweden and internationally. And the goals for energy efficiency, for example, was to be twice as good as baseline standards in Stockholm at the time. And they were ambitious on circular systems for waste and grey water. And a new pneumatic waste collection system was introduced to reduce um, the number of garbage trucks in the area. Unfortunately, uh, very few of those ambitions were met completely, but it's a very, very livable and very liked today by many Stockholmers. And Chinese delegations uh, still come here to learn about Swedish urban planning. And it kind of did set some new standards and uh, ambitions that spread around Sweden and beyond. And we, Cord Architects, uh, contributed with uh, one building in this area. My colleagues who worked on this project can't really remember much of the um, environmental ambi ambitions, apart from the new pneumatic waste collection system and that they were designing walls with a little bit more of insulation. And the next level of sustainability is seen in the Royal Seaport project in the eastern parts of Stockholm, just uh, next to the Royal Natural, National City Park, which is kind of comparable to Stanley Park here in Vancouver. Um, 12,000 new apartments and 35,000 new workplaces, also planned on old brownfields. And it's a continuation of the Hammarby Sjöstad ambitions, but with a higher level of detail and much, much better defined goals. Um, five dimensions of sustainability is used here. Um, a vibrant city, accessibility and proximity, resource efficiency and climate responsibility. Let nature do the work and participation and consultation. So the Royal Seaport has the goal also of becoming fossil fuel free by 2030, according to the C40 Cities Climate Positive Program. And this includes energy used in buildings, some of the transports to and from the area and the waste collection. And no energy put into the area should contain fossil fuels. And this is met by using energy for heating and cooling from the nearby district heating plant and clean energy from hydro, solar and wind and half clean nuclear energy. Um, and the image shows a plus energy building which actually produces more energy than it consumes over a year. And is built with passive house techniques. But what is not calculated so far is all the greenhouse gas emissions from all the construction, such as buildings and roads. And hopefully they will include that in the coming phases of the development. But what I like the most about this area is how they're working with integrated nature and green spaces. Um, for example, there should be no more than 200 meters to a park and they have been looking at green connectivity in the area to strengthen the nearby ecosystems and uh, they have introduced the green space index for greener plots and courtyards and each plot should reach to 0 0.6 when dividing the eco-efficient area with the total site area very progressive and um, the results are very green courtyards and you can see some of the energy produced on the roofs here. 
Um, also working with integrated stormwater management, um, producing really, really nice streetscapes. Uh, there are no pipes for stormwater in, the, in this area. Um, and I really like this area. Uh, Royal Seaport is great in many ways, and I'm really looking forward because it's going to continue for maybe 10, 15 years to finish it. I'm really looking forward to the next phases and how they will improve. All right, you all know this. 2015, um, most nations in the world has now ratified the Paris Agreement. Long-term temperature goal is to keep the increase in global average temperature to well below two degrees and to pursue efforts to limit uh, the increase to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Recognizing that this should substantially reduce the risks and impacts of climate change. And this should be done by peaking greenhouse gas emissions as soon as possible. And this is our first certified building according to the Swedish Green Building Council standards and we reached to level uh, silver. And we met criteria on low energy consumption, good uh, indoor environment in terms of acoustics, air quality, thermal climate and daylight. But we realized that this is far from reaching the Paris Agreement goals. It's almost impossible to build your way to a climate neutral future, at least with the standards we're using today. Even the most progressive certifications for zero carbon buildings include some sort of offsets of emissions. So we decided to start our own kind of think tank, if you like, called Core Development, where we could look at sustainability challenges without a client and funding our work from grants and other sources. And most importantly, writing our own brief. And a common theme in this work is to look at the existing built environment and trying to find vacancies like space vacancies, time vacancies and surface vacancies. Because as we all know, the most sustainable building is the one that's never being built. And in the project 500K, we found that with minor adjustments to planning codes and regulations, we could produce 500,000 new homes if only 1% of the Swedish single family homeowners would divide their homes into two homes yearly. It would be done in 25 years. And for this study, we actually went to Vancouver to look at the Laneway housing project to be inspired and learn for this project. Very helpful. And um, in suburban resilience, we looked at the potential of um, climate adaptation and ecosystem improvements in private gardens from both a top down and a bottom up perspective to produce more ecosystem services that would be beneficial for the whole city. And the Elastic Home, uh, which we're working on right now, looks at a concept for future living based on sharing. And the idea is that your home should be adaptable to your needs over time and in collaboration with other people. It's like co-housing 2.0. You don't only share some space, like a kitchen, for example. The use of space in this project should be more flexible and adaptable to people's needs over time. And the project aims to improve health and well-being, address the issue of loneliness, um, reduce inequalities and lower the consumption of resources. You all seen this. In 2015, the United Nations Sustainable Develop Development Goals were launched. And you've probably seen them organized more uh, like a flag. But I like this order much better. Um, it's explaining how social and economic sustainability goals are all depending on a healthy biosphere. We can also argue that all the goals are relevant for sustainable urban planning, and you should try to meet all these goals in new urban projects. And for the first time, the UN highlighted the importance of sustainable cities and communities. And they said, make cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. In our office, we took an interest in the resilience concept, thanks to our previous connections to the Stockholm Resilience Center um, that we did in our think tank work, and saw that maybe the way to reach urban sustainability could be through resilience. And resilience means the capacity of a system to deal with change and continue to develop. A resilient system can withstand shocks and even use disturbances as a catalyst for renewal and innovation. 
So why do you want to work with resilience? Because the world is in constant flux. Time is always passing. Um, and in relation to sustainability, the resilience concept is more open and adaptable and to change, while the sustainability concept is more like seeking an ideal state um, and preserve it like that, in our view. And the concept of resilience is also good because it distributes risks in a better way. In resilience thinking, you don't put all eggs in the same basket. And the basics for resilience is the understanding of social ecological systems. And that is a pretty new field of science, which has its starting point in the understanding of that man and nature are completely interconnected and that there is a continuous mutual exchange between them. So we can no longer look at ecosystems as separated from humans. And the Stockholm Resilience Center um, has for quite a while been studying what builds resilience in social ecological systems from a variety of perspectives, um, like um, urban food supply systems, coastal fishing communities, and you know, in other urban situations. And the combined results of their research has led to a conclusion that there are seven overarching principles that builds resilience in social ecological systems. Maintain diversity and redundancy, manage connectivity, manage slow variables and feedbacks, foster complex adapt adaptive systems thinking, encourage learning, uh, broaden participation, and promote polycentric governance. So in our work, we're trying to interpret and use these principles as much as we can and adopt this kind of resilience thinking in our project. So let's have a look at these principles and I'll exemplify them with some work that we've done. This is uh, how we look at um, diversity, for example. We're trying to translate the concept of diversity into an urban context and create diversity in a variety of ways, ecologically, socially, and sometimes even economically. And it's the balance between them that interests us the most. And this is an example where our focus was on social diversity. It's a building that's located just outside the city center in Stockholm. We designed a mixed use building with a variety of apartment sizes, um, ground floor commercial spaces, and even an integrated um, preschool in the bottom. Um, right, so that people can meet from different backgrounds and you know, create a better social sustainability in the area. Um, biodiversity, together with photosynthesis, is one of the crucial supporting ecosystem services for our survival on this planet. So to strengthen biodiversity in our cities is of uttermost importance and can be done with, the, for example, the integration of urban nature. And regulatory ecosystem services, like shown in this image, have a lot of beneficial advantages for us humans um, too and should be integrated in the urban context as much as possible, as well as provisioning services like urban agriculture. But, you know, to keep urban ecosystems working, a deep knowledge is needed of how and what actors are integrating and supporting the systems are. And for example, in Stockholm, we have a very loved oak landscape that everybody wants to preserve. And this landscape has one crucial actor or key species. It's a bird, I believe it's a, it, the name is Jay something, who uh, flies around in the oak forest and finds acorns um, and they hide them and then they also forget them so that they can germinate and produce new oaks. But it's not only that, the, the bird also needs conifers to hide from birds of prey. So you can't really cut down anything else. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, um, so the conifers are also needed. And so biodiversity is very, very complex and we always need ecologists on board in the planning process. And now here we go. In reality, <laughs> maybe plants are actually farming us, who knows? Um, right, so this is um, a project we did in Knivsta, a small uh, town just north of Stockholm. It's a project where we have tried to balance uh, all the dimensions of diversity, social, economic, and biological. It's a very central site in this town. Um, it used to be an old parking space. It's very central right next to the town hall and the train station. Um, 
We're proposing a variety of green public spaces, mixed-use buildings uh, with ground floor commercial spaces, and of course, it's all going to be car-free, um, only pedestrian streets within this area. So you park all the cars underneath this new development. Looks like that. Right, so principle number two is to manage connectivity. Um, and like I said, man and nature should be considered as one. Um, and connectivity is about the strength and structure of the connections of how the parts of a network interact. And in urban context, it can be anything from people's movement patterns, roads, uh, public transport to green structures, meeting places and green corridors for plants and animals. And in my view, what strengthens social connectivity the most is to work with the reversed traffic hierarchy. So you should always plan for walking people first and the social connectivity will increase. And in this project that we designed a few years ago, it was called The Bronze by the, the developer, it's not our uh, name up for it. Um, we work with both visual, social and ecological connectivity. And the site is at um, the edge of a small hill and we were seeking to repair the lost connection to nature behind. And we were making gaps and slices in the build structures for green spaces to come closer to the street and also allow for people to access the hill in new ways. And um, another example of how to work with connectivity is this park under a motorway in central Stockholm. And I made this uh, with my previous office, Combine Architects, um, and the brief said that we couldn't design a park for people to stay in uh, due to the risks of accidents on the motorway above. So everything about this park had to be about connecting spaces and moving through it. But it's funny how even though it's designed for movement, uh, people still started using this park in various other ways. Um, for example, for different events and as a meeting point. And it only shows the importance of public space in our cities and how much people need to meet and see each other. Right. So it looks like this. And the third principle is the slow variables. And what, what's that in the urban context? Well, to us, it means that it's the built structures, the flows of energy of food, water, and everything else that goes in and out of our cities daily. Everything that has a longer perspective. Um, and uh, this is an image that's showing some parts of the Vancouver urban metabolism. On the left is the energy going in and out at the bottom, and on the right it's uh, showing the food um, structures going through Vancouver every day or every year, I don't know. Um, and what we need to do is to look at these flows and first of all reduce them and make them more local. And for example, much more energy needs to be produced inside our cities, on buildings, and much more space needs to be used for, for example, food uh, production. And a great tool to assess these systems or flows is uh, something called life cycle assessment or LCA. It's a great tool that should be used much, much more. And the principles of reduce, reuse, recycle is key. And this is valid for all the flows of resources in our cities. And LCA measures the impacts on, on our environment and also gives us a number on how much carbon dioxide emissions each flow has. So we need to scale down, in my opinion, and measure our impacts much more than we do today to be able to fully understand what is sustainable and not. And this is an example of reuse. It's a park in northern Swedish, northern Swedish town called Umeå. It was the same design team as before with combined architects. And all the stone in this project is old keystone that was on the site uh, many years ago and was stored in the forest outside of the city. And we found that and we were super happy that we found a great material that we can use instead of um, producing new materials like concrete. So um, look for recycled and reuse that instead. All right, so this one is um, really important. We have to stop using concrete. It's the most destructive material on Earth. 
And this is from an article from The Guardian in the UK. But I agree, it takes massive amounts of energy to produce cement, which is the binder in concrete. And in that process, massive amounts of carbon dioxide is released into the air. And it's also the worst material for promoting bio biodiversity, completely sealing the earth where it's laid out. But fortunately, there are other options. Wood, for example. The use of cross-laminated timber has a lot of potential, and these are some of the works um, that we've done in wood. This is an interior view from one extension of a small house. Um, this is another one, um, terraced housing uh, close to nature. You can use color on wood, of course. Um, a third one, small-sized houses, different shapes can be made. And nowadays you can always also build higher projects in wood. So use wood. <laughs> okay, so uh, this is pretty complicated to explain, but the whole city needs to be understood as a complex adaptive system. It will never be finished and it will constantly reinvent itself. And our cities must become much more um, flexible and adaptable to create better opportunities to adapt to this inevitable change. And for example, um, this is just one example, you can use um, additions to the city, which we've done a lot. This is a project in central Stockholm where we added two extra floors on an existing uh, office building. Looks like this, it blends in pretty well in the existing urban fabric. Um, another way of working with the um, adaptive system is to look at, um, here's an example from Malmö in the south of Sweden where new species of trees are introduced um, to handle increased temperatures and uh, more rain. So to me, this looks very exotic, but maybe not to you, but I've never seen these kind of trees in the urban environments in Sweden before. So that's you know, how we have to adapt uh, all the time. Principle number five is uh, learning. Um, in our projects, we're encouraging learning in many possible ways. And knowledge constantly needs to be developed and updated, and it can be spatially supported in numerous ways. And the most obvious way is to make room for traditional learning institutions early in projects like schools and preschools, and don't forget the outdoor spaces of those. Um, but this is a little bit more creative way of working with learning. It's a combination of a preschool and a nursing home which we hope will be start built next, uh, late next year. And it's just north of uh, Stockholm. And you know, here kids and older people share the same courtyard, some of the spaces inside as well. And you know, can exchange, exchange knowledge and experience freely. Another way is to incorporate a green learning structure through a whole new master plan. And this is just south of Stockholm, and we call the green space uh, Ecotech, deriving from the French word for library, Bibliothèque. Um, and we see, um, we imagine the Ecotech as an outdoor a library full of learning opportunities about anything that has to do with ecology and the natural world. Uh, you also have to broaden participation. The more people are involved in creating new parts of the city, the more the resilience will increase. It creates better conditions for different types of knowledge to emerge and makes areas more adaptable as people are more engaged and willing to take responsibility. And this can be done with uh, consulting, but also with co-creation and even participation in building and designing. This is an example from Malmö that we didn't do, didn't do where a group of um, citizens were allowed to design and produce this building to their own needs. And in this case, like stacked urban villas in a sort of um, housing consortium. Um, this is very big in Germany, where it's called Baugemeinschaft, and it effectively strengthens the social sustainability of an area. And the final uh, principle is to promote polycentric governance. Um, a system with more than one manager is less vulnerable, of course, by distributing responsibility and control to several actors in a network. And collaboration processes are created and the system as a whole becomes more resilient. Uh, this is an example from Stockholm in my closest park where a group of people 
we're allowed to start a 5,000 square meter permaculture garden in the middle of a public park. It's a win-win situation. The city gets less park to manage and the local residents gets a nice park to grow food and to connect. Um, and you know, if one actor fails, the other one can always step in and take care of the park. Right, so those were the seven principles of resilience. Um, I want to start wrapping up by showing one project where we try to use all these seven principles in one single project. Um, it's uh, in Gustavsberg, uh, about 30 minute bus ride from Stockholm, in the, kind of in the archipelago. Um, and Gustavsberg is a town that sh um, has about 20,000 inhabitants. Um, it's ba built around um, the uh, production of porcelain. They have a big porcelain factory which is still kind of in, uh, running and they have about 100 artist studios in this town. It's a bit spread out, the whole town. Um, the town center is in one part and the porcelain factory is in another part. You have the Baltic Sea coming in and um, the town hall is in the second part and they have very central sport facilities as well which is also a big part of their identity. And we worked in a large project group uh, for this project. We have ecologists, we have landscape architects and architects, traffic planners, economists, and we were asked to produce a new uh, master plan for this area. Um, the master plan that we propose, um, we wanted to keep the strong identity of the cultural heritage and uh, we also wanted to respect the landscape and the nature. And our idea was to connect the disparate part of this uh, town. Um, and we also wanted to make more public space, um, prioritize walking and cycling. Uh, we created attractive public transport in, in the case of a um, transport hub where, where you can change buses in, in a kind of sort of a square. Um, we wanted to propose inclusive and safe housing. Developed, uh, we wanted to develop the sport facilities and keep them in the center to promote health and well-being in this town. And we introduced urban nature and ecosystem services. And we also proposed an incremental development strategy. You don't have to build everything at once. It can be done step by step um, during many years. Um, here are some images from that project. A new park with integrated stormwater management. Um, taking the water through the park and out in the Baltic Sea, cleaning it on the way. Uh, here's how we imagine the developed sport facilities. Um, traditionally it was kind of sports for guys only, uh, hockey and uh, football. So we propose more indoor spaces to um, kind of cater for more the more uh, female side of the population with uh, yoga studios and uh, stuff like that. Um, so, uh, and how were you supposed to live in this new development? Um, so we zoomed in, in at one part of this project um, and we had quite a few restrictions on the sites. Um, there was a required distance to the lake that we couldn't cross. We had some green connectivity that we identified that we wouldn't want to build through. There was a very sensitive biotope on the top of the hill, but also a very beautiful hilltop that we wanted people to access. Um, and we identified um, grounds that were possible to build upon in regards to topography. Um, and this is our proposal for housing in nature. And so we said quite early that we had to build quite densely to save as much uh, nature as possible. We needed to adopt the new buildings to the topography and the landscape. And we only wanted to use wooden buildings in this uh, case. Um, there were a few uh, listed buildings on the site that we decided to, of course, uh, conserve and develop. And there was also some blown away parts of this uh, kind of hill that we uh, wanted to reconstruct. So we, con we wanted to reconstruct the damaged landscape and we also found that we could hide cars under this reconstructed landscape. Um, we integrated stormwater management. Uh, we used, we used uh, programmatic diversity. And like I said before, we wanted public access to nature through this site. Uh, it's a balance um, between public and private spaces and it connects to the surrounding neighbors and the town center. This uh, elevation shows uh, the proposal. Um, you see the town hall to the right and a little bit of dense um, 
development in the middle, um, a little bit higher um, there. And on the left hand side, you see uh, buildings that are kind of um, sneaking up on this hill and kind of hiding in the forest. Uh, we also used a different color on the left hand side to really make them integrated into the landscape. This section shows uh, how we um, heal the landscape again uh, by uh, putting the development there and letting the new landscape kind of slide down over the development or the buildings, uh, the courtyard, and underneath uh, there's room for, uh, for parking. And all people should park here and those living on the hill has to leave their car here because the, the development should be car free up on the hill. This image shows one of the listed buildings uh, made out of brick and how we adapted our design in regards to that. So the lower parts are in brick and the higher parts are in, in wood. And you also see the um, new proposed square that's going to connect the town hall with this new development and the street with shops and uh, a bus station. This is a section showing um, kind of smaller, a bit less dense housing, uh, kind of up on the hill. And our idea, idea here was to make um, apartments where everyone uh, should open their doors to free space. So there are, um, there are kind of entrance balconies on the higher floors here. And um, we were very careful how we placed the buildings in regards to views from the um, central part of the town and you see that the buildings kind of blend in kind of with the nature. Uh, very nice views. And this is a street uh, up on the hill and you really see how we place the buildings in the nature, in regards to the nature and um, letting people kind of really live in the landscape. Okay, these are my three last slides. Um, for the Jericho lands, um, as you know, we don't have much time to meet the Paris Agreement. So think hard on what you propose for that site uh, because the carbon budget is uh, almost out. So it has to be carbon neutral, the new development. Um, I recommend you to use the seven principles of resilience if you like. Uh, we find it very, very useful in our projects at least. And I'd like us to stay within the planetary boundaries. Thank you. The mic. The mic. Yeah. Well, maybe I'll start with this mic. Yeah. <laughs> while I wait for the handheld to come down. Thank you very much. Lots of uh, ideas and yeah. um, kind of conceptual ideas, but also design ideas and really exciting to see uh, some things that are different and some things that are quite uh, similar uh, to, uh, you know, we could take some of those projects and imagine them in parts of uh, Metro Vancouver. Mm -hmm. Um, at the end of today's session, we're going to hear from the city of Vancouver, from Neil Rishoe, about op coming opportunities to engage in conversations about the Jericho Lands Project specifically um, and where to direct your questions around the, uh, the project. Thank you. Um, but right now we have an opportunity for some questions for Magnus and um, for the work that he has and the ideas that he has presented tonight. Um, if you have jotted down any questions on those little white cards, um, those can start coming up. There are some of our staff colleagues from the city in the green shirts. Just hand your questions to them and they'll bring them up. If you need uh, white cards to write questions down on, uh, please feel free to wave your hand and thank you. Um, the lights are helping. Mm -hmm. If you're watching on live stream, please provide comments through the Facebook link and those will be provided up to us as well. So I'm going to let you have the podium, Magnus, and I'm going to go stand over there. Okay. These are good questions. Okay. Is this on? <laughs> Am I on? Yeah, thank you. Uh, do you have alternatives to concrete for foundations and underground parking? Um, no, I don't. <laughs> 
No, it's really hard to find alternatives, um, at least in larger um, developments. Um, the projects that we are that I've shown um, also use concrete, but you know a guideline should be to minimize the use of concrete. Um, there is one material which is made out of glass, kind of. I don't know the English word for that. Um, foam glass, kind of, which you can use, but I don't, I'm not sure if you can use them in, in larger developments. But for smaller projects, they're okay. Buildings are built to be static for 50 to 100 years. Do you think we need to consider living buildings that more closely emulate nature? Ooh, uh, wow, yeah, that would be nice. <laughs> um, yes, I suppose. <laughs> Um, but I think, yeah, you can look at buildings as living things if you kind of alter them along the way and um, you plan for them to be one thing in 50 years, but then, you know, society will change. So they will ultimately be um, rebuilt and changed. So living, I don't know, but we kind of alter them um, as we live in them, I would say. So they should, you know, be able to be transformed. <clears throat> so this question is um, maybe building on that, uh, no pun intended, on that living question mm -hmm. again. Um, buildings in cities are fundamentally exclusionary to nature, such as plants and animals. Is there a way to include them, plants and animals, in our built world? Um, yeah, I think it depends on how dense you want to build, um, of course, that's the number one question. If you build uh, with l lesser density, you can always include nature in your projects. Um, if you're in a super dense uh, urban environment, um, well, you have to start looking at uh, all the surfaces that we have. Um, the roof is one good example, and we have great examples of how you can uh, do green roofs, for example. Um, living walls are uh, also possible to do, they're harder to maintain. Um, but yeah, you should be looking at more creative ways of in integrating nature on buildings as well as uh, integrating you know, energy production as well. So those two together could produce something wonderful, I would think. I think there's a couple of questions that are coming in related to ownership structure. And so maybe can you talk about some of the uh, tenure um, and ownership structure of some of the, of the built work that you've shown? Uh, I know you showed one of the co-op buildings, but in others from that. Um, okay. Um, let's start with the Royal Seaport, for example. Um, they have a 50-50 idea, so that 50% should be rental and 50% should be um, to buy. Um, in our project it varies a lot. Sometimes it's rental and sometimes it's um, um, condominiums. Um, they usually don't mix in the same building in Sweden, which is a shame because that would be beneficial. I think you do that here in Vancouver, even in the same building. No? Yeah? Do you know? <laughs> uh, rental and condominiums in the same building? Uh, not in the same. No, but right next to each other maybe. Yes, there, there's a mix of, of tenures within a building. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. But, um, well, the big thing in Sweden is that, you know, um, the rental uh, buildings are being sold as uh, condominiums now. So they're kind of forcing people out of rentals to make money, the landlords, um, which is um, quite a big debate about in, in Stockholm at the moment. So it's pushing um, people who rent like further, further and further out of the city center. So with the Royal Seaport one, you're saying that's 50% rental and 50% uh, fee simple ownership. Mm -hmm. Was that a, a requirement that was provided? The Royal Seaport was a municipally owned Yeah, land? it's completely 100% owned. The land is owned by the municipality. Um, they have put out uh, their goal. Uh, so they uh, allocate land to, um, to meet that criteria. So if you want to build rentals, you have to wait for your kind of turn when it's time for rentals in one um, plot. Uh, so the municipality takes care of um, takes care of that. Let's say. Great. Um, I think you've talked about uh, how uh, wood 
uh, building and timber is um, is not that it's a new idea, but no. um, in terms of taller buildings, it's something that is a new idea, and certainly we're seeing some of that evolve here in Vancouver. Mm -hmm. um, this question is, can timber construction create effective sound insulation? Yes, but that's the hardest point. Uh, um, that's the hardest thing with timber at the moment, at least in Sweden. Most people think um, about uh, fire and um, what's it called, st st um, construction and stability. But uh, acoustics is the, is the hardest thing actually at the moment because uh, you know, sound spreads kind of well with wood. So it's a tricky one and uh, most uh, acoustic people are only used to working with concrete. So they're not really familiar with uh, the, the, this new material. So I think we, we will kind of get there quite soon, but right now it's, it's the main issue of uh, working with wood, but it's possible, it's definitely possible. And I think we also need to learn to live with, with that new kind of acoustics um, um, again, because now we kind of live in a sealed off environment, which has no sound from the outside. We can't hear our neighbors, but you know, it would be nice if we knew that we had neighbors in our building, right? So. <laughs> I think we just have to accept that wood is, um, is, is good. Um, so the project that you were showing at the end, um, you were mm. identifying that there was um, the, the parking and then there was some areas where the cars wouldn't go. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about the strategies that facilitated um, car-free in part of the development? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, there are no regulations on how far you can walk to your car in Sweden. Um, and we also have a quite low um, uh, requirement on how many cars per um, housing unit. Um, in this project it was 0 0.8, I think. So not everyone could even have a car in, in this project. Um, and so instead uh, we're working with um, carpools. So we actually did propose a few parking spots uh, up on the hill for carpools. So you can use that. But if you wanted to have an, uh, your own car, you would have to walk like 200 meters to get your car. Um, and that's, you know, not a big thing in Sweden. It's, 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 uh, um, it's normal. And we were talking about that earlier, is that, um, the, that one of the things that you had noticed here in Vancouver was the, um, the emphasis on the car. And of course, mm -hmm. that's something that North America has grown up around, whereas in Sweden and other parts of Europe, um, there's the evolution um, of the car. Um, there was many years before any of, um, of the infrastructure was put in place for it. Yeah. But, um, but I know it's something that uh, the modes sh uh, share here in, in Vancouver is headed in a good direction and, and an area of focus. Mm -hmm. um, this is a pretty good theoretical one, and I'm curious to the answer. I don't know if you have the answer, but it's certainly something that we can all continue to talk about and research. Has your company or any other company in Sweden built a zero GHG emission building, including construction, so the embodied energy? Mm -hmm. If not, how far away is this goal? Our company certainly hasn't. Um, I know of one project, it's a grocery store actually called Lidl, it's a German grocery store. And they um, made their whole new grocery store in wood and uh, very low um, um, energy in use in operation. But they still had to offset some of their um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions on you know, external projects. So they're kind of getting there but not 100% yet. And we have also a new uh, standard coming up. Um, it's being tested. I think this Lidl or grocery store project was testing that standard um, to see um, if it's usable or applicable to other projects as well. So we're close, but not 100% there yet. Great. Mm. Elastic City. Yeah. Can you please elaborate? <laughs> Elastic City, yeah. Um, I don't know. It's probably something that has uh, more open spaces and maybe a little bit more um, general spaces, built spaces, so that you don't define um, what the space should be from the beginning. Um, if it's a workspace or a housing thing, maybe we need to look at uh, alternatives for that so that you don't um, lock yourself into uh, one function in, in, in the built structures. 
Um, that could be one answer to, to this question, to be more general in what you, you propose and what you build so that it can transform into new uses uh, over time. So it linked to the whole concept of adaptability. Yeah. Time. And I'm curious in the example that you showed that had the preschool with the seniors mm -hmm. uh, resident. Yeah. Um, was there elasticity built into? Um, not so much. Um, well, the preschool was at the ground floor and the nursing home was on the other levels. And there were just a few um, spaces that were undefined on how to use them. So both kind of could use them for different purposes. So that's a little bit of elasticity in that building. Can you talk, I know this is a, a subject matter that is uh, near and dear to um, the region of, of Metro Vancouver, mm -hmm. but also many other parts of, of North America and, and indeed the whole world. But, uh, and I know you've talked about how this is part of the focus of your work, um, the concept of affordability Mm -hmm. for housing and for workspaces and how that shows up in your work? Yeah, um, you know, it's really hard when you're working with developers to, to tell them what to do. Um, so uh, they tell us what to do most of the times and we try to resist. But um, um, that's why we started this um, kind of think tank that I talked about to kind of think of ideas that would produce um, alternatives to the mainstream. So the one that was, would produce 500,000 new buildings, I know it's not very successful in Vancouver, it still doesn't cater to the um, poorer people. Um, um, but we're hoping that kind of, if you share more, it will give opportunities for, for, for more options, uh, perhaps on affordability as well. And, um, and linked to that in terms of the form and, and typology of buildings, mm -hmm. um, is affordability in Sweden also looking at high rises as a means to increasing the supply? Um, no, uh, more like into um, modular uh, building systems so, uh, so that they should be really, really fast to assemble and they have a standard um, kind of um, measurements and uh, then you can produce buildings really fast. That's the way we're trying to solve the affordability thing. <clears throat> uh, linked to that yeah. and, uh, and linked to, um, to the concept of reduce, reuse, recycle, which you touched on, um, can buildings be designed so that they can be dismantled without destroying their materials so that materials can be reused in new construction or um, not as we, the way we build today, no, they can't, but we're seeing trends to um, increase the, those possibilities and I hope like in the near future all like built materials should have a, 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 a tag for them so that you know how to recycle them in the future. And we see those kind of trends, not so much in Sweden, but uh, Holland has, um, you know, are very f f uh, long way ahead in that kind of thinking. So to become much more circular in the material used in, in buildings. So you should look for, for the Netherlands uh, uh, if you want to know the best ways of you know, recycled materials. Great. Um, this one is going back again to the concept of intergenerational mm -hmm. um, um, planning. And, um, and the question is, where are the teenagers considered? in the built city? <laughs> uh, not in that project, no, they weren't. Um, and they're overlooked many times. Um, so, um, you know, I have no good answer to that. Not in that project. Um, and we rarely work with teenagers, actually. So that's a super good question. Maybe that should be our next research. Uh, where did teenagers go? Thank you. <laughs> um, in terms of the laneway houses, and I know you've asked me about this earlier today, and mm -hmm. we looked at some of them. Um, is this something that's being pursued in Sweden? And no, unfortunately not. We're going to all the municipality that we um, that we can, and to present this work. But so far, none has you know done it. No one has done it, and they think it's interesting, and they think that it has potential. But you know, it has to do with the work that they have to put in in like old um, um, plans 
uh, and the municipality has a lot to do usually, so they chose to foc focus on new developments instead. So they don't want to go in and change the zoning for, for old uh, plants, um, which why I don't know, but uh, you know, they prefer not to do that. It's, it's a, probably a very difficult process with the you know, inhabitants and all. Oh, we were talking about this also earlier today. Um, uh, what is your opinion on the future of electric cars in cities, given the slow adoption of renewable yeah. energy? Yeah, well, there is a risk that people will start, you know, being much more lazy than they are today. If you just can just call an, <laughs> a vehicle and just be transported to wherever you are. Um, so maybe there will be more cars uh, in our streets uh, because of that. So I'm really hoping that you know we can have autom automated um, public transport instead, so that people you know share their vehicles much much more and don't use them you know individually so much. So that's the future that I would like to see instead. A great stack of questions, but yeah. some of them I've already read. Um, I think this is something that probably many of us think about quite a lot. Um, and I see it, the thread running through a lot of what you've spoken about. But how do you, we, mm -hmm. <laughs> enable the social change required to make these kinds of development a reality? Oof. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I don't know, maybe this process that you're in for the Jericho Lands is one key to, to become more, um, you know, um, close to that. Because as, as the more you engage people, the more, you know, people are being proud and can accept change. If you, if you understand what's going on and if you're part of what's going on, I think you will um, accept change much more easily. So let's see, maybe the, the Jericho Lands is going to set the standards for this. And um, so maybe just coming back to the um, declaration of the climate emergency that you read out at mm -hmm. the beginning, um, was there some thinking behind that, that, uh, that the profile that is given to that serves to help drive social change? Have you seen any of that in that process? Uh, no, not so. There are 11 kind of uh, goals in it after the declaration that I read that we wanted to do, but it's more about how the building industry should change and to become much more um, aware of greenhouse gases and how we build and stuff like that. So it has very little to do with social uh, aspects, um, actually. So that's mainly focused on, on the construction industry, I would say, that's yeah. declaration. Yeah. So driving the change within the industry specifically. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, do a lot of people work from home in Sweden? Is something that is built into, uh, I mean, it's back to the elasticity and the, the adaptability, but yeah, uh, a lot of people notion do. of, of yeah. reducing transportation needs by virtue of bringing work closer to where you live. Absolutely, yeah, you hear more and more people saying that, you know, I will, I will work from home one day a week or even two days a week. In our office, it's, we, we all have laptops and it's no problem to stay home and work one day. If you just, you know, do what you're supposed to do, it's no problem. Um, so, um, yes, uh, a lot of people work from home in Sweden, in all industries, I would say. My wife, working in the fashion industry, she's doing it also. Um, pretty easily. Have you found the local policymakers generally in favor of your proposed designs that push boundaries and, um, and how do you deal with challenges when there are um, engineering priorities that come before system thinking? Um, good question. Uh, there's always like um, when you build cities there's always collaboration so we're um, kind of open to that. So we try to get as many people on board as possible uh, at a very early stage. Um, so we work, we have engineers in our office um, and we work with uh, gladly with the traffic engineers and you know, so I would say it's not really a friction, it's more of a collaboration. Um, and we have a consensus um, culture in Sweden as well, so there's not that much friction going on. Nobody gets angry in meetings, and uh, it's pretty, you know, smooth to 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 work uh, in 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 Sweden. I would say. 
I don't know if I answered the question, but <laughs> gave you some insights on how it is to work there at least. Yeah, I think it's, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's something that um, is, uh, you know, I think often the challenges are common, um, mm. but often the attempts to overcome those challenges are also common. And, yeah. and but in regards to planning, though, we have a weird system of, um, you know, consulting that um, Consulting comes into play uh, uh, after you made the proposal. So you come to these consulting meetings with, with a finished proposal, basically. And you know the only people who come, they're, they're there to just uh, say no. And all the other voices who kind of maybe likes it, they don't care to show up, of course. So those meetings are super weird. You always prepare for the worst and uh, you know some angry people shows up and it gets um, it's pretty strange. So. You know that this uh, process that you're starting here in in the Jericho Lands is probably the way to do it, so that you, you know, take everyone's voice in from the beginning, and you know you won't be up to any surprises when you see the, the proposal later. <clears throat> I think there was an answer to the soundproof. <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh, staggered floor joists. <laughs> okay, I don't know what that means, but... <laughs> Thank you for that. Mm. Um, I think at this point I am going to pass the floor over to Neil Rochoe from the City of Vancouver, who's going to talk a little bit more about the planning process that this city is engaged in um, as we move towards a policy statement for the Jericho Lands. Uh, at this point, before Neil comes up, I would uh, like to thank you, Magnus, and Neil will do a much better job. <laughs> Thanks. Good evening, and thank you for everyone for joining us tonight. I think we can all get excited about the idea of the Jericho Lands being an international model for the future of resilient, sustainable, equitable, inclusive, vibrant neighborhoods, and really pouring all of our efforts into that conversation as we move forward. I'm Neil Rochoe, uh, Assistant Director for Community Planning for the City of Vancouver. And I'll begin my remarks by recognizing that this event is hosted on the unceded traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations, and thanking them for hosting us this evening. I'd also like to thank the Canada Lands team for the role in organizing this talk, and of course for Magna Schoen, who in typical Scandinavian fashion delivered profound thoughts and, and implications in a very matter-of-fact, nonchalant way, and uh, for really provoking some excellent questions from a deeply engaged audience. Thank you very much. Tonight's remarks are the fourth Inspire Jericho talk and our first major engagement since the summer. In the coming months, the city team will be sharing a detailed summary of what we've heard since launching the Jericho Lands last March. In that time, the city, working with the MST partnership and CLC, we've hosted more than 20 events with over 2,500 participants from across the city. To become or stay involved, please visit the city's website at vancouver.ca forward slash Jericho Lands, where you can sign up for all future email updates. Planning for the future of the Jericho Lands is guided by the collaboration and coordination between the city of Vancouver, the MST partnership and CLC, and the community. We aspire to work with the landowners, the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh, in their stewardship of these lands and how best to incorporate their living culture into the contemporary city. The community plays a critical role in informing the discussions and development of the policy statement that will guide redevelopment and change for the 90-acre Jericho lands. The site is a place where we can all chart a course forward while addressing issues and opportunities, be that transportation, affordability, sustainability, reconciliation, and others, in a way that both reflects our shared past and builds a better place for us and for the generations to come after us. Tonight, you have been more of one of more than 150 who took the time to hear from Magnus about incorporating resilience, 
inclusiveness, and sustainability into our cities. We ask that you share your feedback with us on the red cards provided and leaving them with city staff as you head home this evening. Thank you again for being here and for being part of the feature of the Jericho Lands. Thank you.